So here's a question for all of the singles here, and if you're not single, cast your mind back in time to when you were. Who would you marry? Right? What do you have in mind when you contemplate the person that you would marry? Any of the engineers here, they're like, well, that's easy. I'll just consult my 79-point checklist of the person I will marry uh, and see if they meet those criteria. Now, you might laugh, but I've actually met that engineer before, and I sat there with him and looked at his criteria list, and I was like, wow, people actually do this. Um, so, yeah, maybe that's just, or maybe your style's just like, oh, no. I'll just meet them and I'll know that they're the one, you know. There'll be this certain pop or something that happens and, uh, and you'll go, they're the person, right? Um, of course, all the Christians here are like, well, first and foremost, they will love Jesus. And absolutely, that is our first and foremost criteria. But it takes something more than that usually too, doesn't it? I mean, it's not like you just go, oh, well, you're a Christian, let's get married. Um, and so usually there's a little bit more to it than that. But I wonder, what would the anti-list be like? So if you were to draw up a list of the person you wouldn't marry, what might that list look like? Those flaws, those deep inexcusable things that just cannot be overlooked like men, the woman who confuses rugby and rugby league, right? You're just like, sorry, we just can't go any further, right? Um, those deeper issues that are just absolutely unable to get past. Um, it might be, you know, the person who votes for, and I'll just leave it there. Uh, I'm not about to get political, but, you know, so maybe you've got a strong rule around that. Or maybe it's about their moral failures. They need to honour Christ and to have never fallen away. They need to be an unsullied person according to this list that I have created. Now, all of this is really, really critically important for us to think about because Jesus has just finished talking to Nicodemus and explaining to him what it takes to be saved. That he needed to be born again by putting his faith in Christ alone, by trusting that Jesus would die for his sins and that in Christ he would have life forevermore. The whole of chapter 3 of the Gospel of John is this incredibly clear declaration to Nicodemus, the Pharisee of Pharisees, the teacher of teachers, on how he can get to heaven and be with God forever, forevermore. So I ask you the question, is Nicodemus God's type? Right? So this is actually a critical, uh, important question. Jesus explains in depth to Nicodemus what it means to be saved. So is Nicodemus the type of guy that God wants to get to heaven, that will be united with him evermore? You see, I think this is the risk that John run, uh, runs in telling this story in this place. Is God after the powerful, wealthy, morally upright elite? Because that's who Nicodemus was. So here we've got this long, lengthy explanation to the powerful, wealthy of the world. This is how you can get to heaven. But what about the people who don't? who don't meet the list of Nicodemus. Do they have a place in eternity? What about you and me? Precious few of us reach Nicodemus' standard. What about the person in this room who's addicted to pornography, gossiping, alcohol, anger, the approval of others, lying? None of these traits appear on anyone's list of a potential marriage partner, and yet they do make up the sum of people in this very room. Do we have a place in God's kingdom? Right? That's the question that our passage this morning, I think, answers. 
John has picked two stories and he's put them back to back to show us who can come into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus and the woman at the well. So if you have your Bible, you can open up to John chapter 4. I've got a bit of a lengthier passage to read together this morning, but praise God, it's his word. So we're going to read from verse 1 to 26. So John chapter 4, 1 to 26. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples... He left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and the livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Amen. Our wonderful passage of scripture that we can look at together this morning. Now Jesus begins, oh well sorry, John begins by setting the scene for us. So the Pharisees hear that Jesus is baptizing more disciples than John. Now it makes note, Jesus wasn't actually doing it, but Jesus' disciples were doing the baptizing. Now why does he make a point out of this? If you go back in our story of the Gospel of John, we already know that the Sanhedrin, the ruling council over the Jews, had sent a delegation to question John the Baptist because of his popularity. So A, they're interested in, is he a prophet? Is he someone who might be from God? And B, as we learn throughout the entirety of the Gospels, they are also very threatened about anyone else having power and authority. So if any figure rises up as being popular, they want to know what is going on. And so John says, word gets to the the Sanhedrin that Jesus is now baptizing more than John. Straight away that tells you they're going to be very interested from this point forward on who Jesus is, what he does, because he's a threat potentially to their power, okay? So that's why John makes the mention here, and it also means that they move from the Judean countryside to Galilee, so they're distancing themselves again from 
Judea. Um, now, before we get right into the text, there's something else we need to have a quick look at to set the scene. Those of you who were here in the church last year for our entire Old Testament overview series where we went through every book of the Old Testament, we looked at uh, its historical themes, uh, its historical context, its major themes, and how does it reveal Jesus. Who were the Samaritans? Come on, this is a test, you've got to answer, it's not rhetorical. Crossbred from where? Come on, people, come on. We did this all year. The northern ten tribes, right? So we had two in the south, ten in the north. The northern ten tribes were conquered by, does anyone remember? Assyria, thank you. That was good. We're getting some confidence going now. They were conquered by Assyria, and Assyria had a policy which was to intermingle, to mix racially, have children in order to breed out the dominance of the culture that they conquered. In the south, Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians who left you alone. So the Jewish line that we're reading about now in John have come from the southern tribes who were previously conquered by Babylon but have remained pure Jewish people. The Samaritans are those intermingled ten tribes from the north. So the Jews believed that they were basically blood traitors. They despised them utterly to their core for being mixed blood Jews. Which is why, as we go on through this text, this woman is able to say, you know, well, you Jews say that we should worship here, but, you know, we think we can worship here. They have a connection. They've got a joint kind of connection here. So we've got to understand that picture. Now, have we got our little map, Chris? Is it working? All right, here we go. Look at the technology. This is just to explain a common myth that you hear being preached, and just so you can get a better visual of it. Um, My eyes aren't good enough to read that, so I'll have to turn around. What we have down here in the bottom is Judea and Jerusalem. And then what we have up the top is Galilee. So that is where they are now going to travel to. Okay? What we have in the middle, in the yellow there, is Samaria. Now, you could travel straight through Samaria and up to Galilee. Or, if you want to avoid Samaria entirely, you can see the dotted lines. You can go across and around the yellow and back and up. Now, you'll commonly hear people say, I've heard this a lot in churches, it's not a big deal, but they'll say, and Jesus decided it was a special thing to go and reach the Samaritans, and so he went through Samaria when normally no one ever did this, and that's simply not true. So just so you know, the normal route that Jews travelled, if they had to go up there, was straight through Samaria. So Josephus was a famous Jewish historian, and Josephus wrote that no one liked having to go through Samaria, But normally, everybody did because the journey was so much quicker. And just to help your geography, over here on the right-hand side was actually Gentile territory. So your choice as a Jew was to either travel through Gentile territory and possibly get unclean or to cut through Samaria and all of the, the hatred and bigotry they had going on there. So it was normal practice to cut up through Samaria. All right? So... Just so you know, that's the geography of what's going on in this particular story. So whilst it was normal to cut through Samaria, they had set rules about how you had to go about this, which we can actually read in the Jewish collected writings. So if you travelled through Samaria, you were not to sit and eat a meal with a Samaritan. However, because you needed to get supplies, it was okay for you to travel into town and buy supplies as long as they were kosher, as long as they were fitting for a Jew to consume, all right? So there were all these rules and regulations based around how you had to travel through Samaria. All of that is important because we're going to read later on that the disciples weren't present because they were where? In town buying food, which was allowed according to the Jewish regulations as long as it fit the principles. So it's not unusual for Jesus and the uh, disciples to be cutting through Samaria on their way north. But some unusual things are about to happen. 
As I said, we read in verse 8 that the disciples have gone into town to buy food, which is okay. And Jesus sits down beside the well. Don't miss the absurdity of that statement. The tension that John has been building for us. Remember that we've consistently seen in the Gospel of John, he's focused in on the divinity of Christ, hasn't he? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, right? So we've got this whole idea of who Jesus is, the divine one, that all things were created in Jesus, by Jesus, and for Jesus. I just want you to think about that for a moment. Jesus created everything by the power of his word. And if you ever want to see the ridiculousness of the incarnation, that is God taking on flesh, think of this picture. Jesus taking on flesh and then being so tired, he has to sit down on the creation that he spoke into being and rest. Right? You see the tension that John's creating for us here? He's like, this is we can skip along something so simple, and yet it is so incredibly profound that the creator of all things was tired and had to take a break. Because although he's 100% God, he's also 100% man. And Jesus, in his humanity, had to live the life that we live. He rested. The maker, creator of all things, went to the bathroom. Right? He was a man, and he got tired. And it's incredible for us to think that he who is God, is God, stooped down to live like us, to pay the penalty of your sin. Right? That should never cease being amazing. That the maker creator would live like that, to pay the penalty of our sin. Now, we need to understand this woman a little bit more. Now, we're from Bundaberg, and we've talked about this before, but we get this. In the middle of summer, if you had to hike a long way to get a collection of water and then lug it back home, would you choose in Bundaberg to A, go early in the morning, B, middle of the day, or C, in the cool of the evening? Anyone here going middle of the day? No. Except maybe Elkie, who would still find that cool. But, you know. Um, anyway, right, we all know in the heat, you don't go out in the middle of the day. And so we, here we have mentioned that this woman was going out to collect water in the middle of the day. Now, that is an absolutely bizarre statement. Now, we have to kind of think this through. Why would anyone go and collect water in the middle of the day? What we know for a fact is collecting water was largely the role of younger women uh, in, the, in the kind of Jewish and Sumerian household. And they largely went in the morning and evening and they went in groups for safety. Okay, so that's normally how it happened. And here we have a woman in the middle of the day on her own. Why? Well, I take you back to verses uh, 16 through to 18 of the text. John chapter 4, 16 to 18. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you were right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. This is a broken woman who not only is a broken woman, but she would have a certain notoriety as being a sinful woman. She has been married five times. We don't have any knowledge in the story of why she's been married so many times. Has she simply had the worst possible uh, luck as a woman and that each of her husbands has died untimely deaths before their time? We don't know. Is she a gold digger in modern parlance and she has been marrying for money one after another? We don't know. What we do know is she has had five husbands and now she is living with a man who is not her husband. She is living in 
sin. So we have to kind of read this into the story a little bit, but it would seem as though she is a notoriously sinful woman who is probably not welcome to travel to the well with the other women. Probably for her to go to the well with other women would mean nothing but ridicules, stares, people talking behind her back, calling her rude names, giving her nothing but a hard time. And so here she is in the middle of the day, in the heat, when no one wants to be out there because she's at least alone and doesn't have to endure the ridicule of the people around her. The story of the woman at the well. Could there be a more different person than Nicodemus? Don't you love the way John has put this together for us? Nicodemus, the teacher of teachers, a member of the ruling council, the Sanhedrin, and Jesus communicates with him how to be saved. And then the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman who seems to have all kinds of notorious sin in her life. Was she sinful, church? Yeah. Yeah, she was. But it's an interesting thought, isn't it, in a world where we've all fallen short of the glory of God where the Bible says that there is no one righteous, not one. There's a tendency at times for all of us to think a little better of ourselves than we should. In this woman, I think we really have a reflection of our own soul. The way that she sneaks to the well at midday to hide from others is how all of us, in fact, walk through this life, is it not? I've mentioned this before, but how many of you would be comfortable if we put on the screen up here, up here for us all to see, gathered together, every one of your sinful thoughts in the last week, every one of your sinful actions in the last week alone, if we just had that scrolling up for everyone to see? No. We all like to hide. Hide away who we really are, just like this woman going to the well in the middle of the day. Our thoughts, regrets, secrets, our shame, carefully cloaked from the eyes of others, lest they see what we're really like. So can you imagine the shock when this broken, shamed, Samaritan woman sneaks out to the well in the middle of the day and comes across a Jewish man and he proposes to her. Now you might be sitting there going, Sam is off his rocker. What do you mean he proposes to her? Well, I'm telling you, this is what happens in the text. Okay, single men in the church, here is a tip for you. Go to the well. Where does Isaac get his wife from? Anyone? At the well. Where does Jacob find his wife? Anyone? At a well. Where does Moses find his wife? Yeah, thank you. I thought it should be getting louder by now that the point would be coming across. That's right. So they all managed to meet someone at the well. Like I said, Going to fetch water was predominantly a job of the younger women and they would go in the morning and the evening. So if you're a single man, then the well was a good place to hang out. So I've mentioned this before too. Maybe we should just put a well in the church somewhere and the young ones, you know, you can all meet at the well. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure that'll work. But anyway, right? So here we have this common story, this common refrain to all of those stories. We don't have time to go through them all in depth. But in each one of those stories, here's what happened. Someone journeys to a foreign country. In each one of those stories, if you go through and check them out, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, someone journeys to a foreign country. The man encounters a woman at the well. Someone draws water from the well. The woman hurries home to bring news of the visitor. 
The visitor stays with the woman's family and it mentions having a meal. And lastly, the two parties are joined as one. It happens in each of those stories. They were very well-known stories. And John has made the point that this was Jacob's well, further linking these stories together. So if that's true, if that pattern of the journey, a woman, drawing water, news, hospitality, and adjoining, we should see that unfold here in this story, if that's true. Amen? Someone give me an amen. Thank you. So this woman comes to the well, and Jesus asks her to draw him a cup of water. A Jewish man alone, for the disciples had gone into town, a Jewish man alone asks her for a drink. Now you can almost sense the cheeky response of the woman here, right? Because this is a known kind of story. This is a known way of kind of uh, a couple coming together. And so if you go back to the story, verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Do you get it? There's this kind of playful banter at the start, isn't it? Where do you get this living water? You can't even reach this water, right? There's a general sense of playfulness as she tries to figure out who it is that makes, uh, asks her to draw water from the well. Whoever drinks from the water I will give him will never get thirsty again, says Jesus. It will be a well springing up for eternal life. Church, Jesus has a bride, doesn't he? The church. Jesus gave up his life for his bride. He laid down his life for the broken, for the sinners who know that their life is not right with God. Jesus paid the penalty of their sin on the cross, bearing its shame and bearing the anger of the Father against sin. Those who come to Jesus receive forgiveness and eternal life in his name and become part of his eternal bride. Jesus does propose to this woman. He offers her eternal life, the hope of eternity with God, the chance to be born again, and for her to be welcomed into the bride of Jesus Christ, his church. That is what's unfolding in this story. She has a place to come into the bride of Christ. I knew a, a very godly man years ago on camps that I used to be a part of. He's a really gentle pastoral figure. He used to just kind of sit in a corner. And, and this dude, I mean, he looked rough. Looked like he'd lived a hard life. He was covered in tattoos, which had been done from, you know, like the ink barrel of a pen, like prison tat kind of things. They weren't really well done tattoos. And he just looked like he'd had a really hard life. And one day I was kind of really tired and I grabbed a cup of coffee and I just sat there beside him. And I said, you know, we've been sitting on these camps for ages. Can you tell me your story? As a young boy, he'd been sexually abused by his neighbor. As he got a little bit older, the sexual abuse then moved across to his uncle. By the time he was 13, he was a complete and utter mess and ran headlong into the homosexual scene and lived a life of absolute brokenness. In and out of prison, in and out of trouble. And then someone shared him the good news of Jesus Christ. When I knew him, he was a married man with children, a whole, kind, born-again man, who used to sit there and gently share and help those who were struggling on the camps. You see, there's a place in the bride of Christ for everyone, no matter how broken. They simply reach out to him. This is one of the amazing things about being a Christian. The Bible says that we are born again, born again of the Spirit, 
born again and set free from the chains of sin. Yes, we still struggle with sin in this life, but the struggle is against a defeated enemy rather than a foe to be conquered. Right? We're set free from sin and death. And Jesus comes to this woman from the despised Samaritans, despised by her own people, with her string of failed relationships and proposes to her, says to her, join your life with mine for all eternity in the bride of my church. Offers her a place with the perfect groom forevermore. See, Nicodemus, who represented the religious elite, the powerful and wealthy of society, was told that he needs to be born again. Now, this woman who is powerless, immoral, and broken is offered the chance to be born again, right? The gospel reaches out to both groups. Salvation is not about a specific people. It's not about a specific place. Salvation comes to all who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Did you notice what Jesus said back in the end of our uh, passage? But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. Do you know what spirit here is not the Holy Spirit? He's looking for people to worship him in spirit and truth. And this word spirit here, it means passion. It means heartfelt, right? We get this so often in our lives, don't we? It's me and Big Neil Hutch in a room together at State of Origin time, and you'll see passion as the wonderful New South Wales Blues win again, Um, right? So you'll see incredible spirit and passion. It's heartfelt. It grips us and we get into it. You'll see that um, in a wedding ceremony. You'll see passion. You'll see people who are entirely gripped with love for one another. You will see it at a funeral when the grief someone feels over a loved one lost grips their heart and soul. And it's that spirit that we are meant to see in our love for God. A consuming passion for the one who has saved us and redeemed us. True worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. They'll be consumed by passion for the one who redeemed them. It's okay to put your hands in the air when you sing. It's not a sin, right? If that's how you want to express passion for God, then that's okay. David danced in his ephod before the Lord in all his might. It was spirit. It was a passionate act to worship God. That's what Nicodemus was lacking. See, Nicodemus was a man of the books. Nicodemus was a man who was coming to Jesus and he was trying to reason his way into the kingdom of heaven. Let me figure out, Jesus, what you're saying. How does it square away with the other things that I have learned? He's a man of knowledge, but not a man of the spirit, not a man of passion for God. And now we've got the woman at the well and Boy, is she someone who's known passion, maybe lust throughout her life. She needs to come to the place of truth. See, it's not enough to have spirit and passion, but we've also got to submit ourselves to the truth of God's Word. So we know Christians, we meet people in churches who are all about passion for Jesus and they sing the loudest and they sometimes do dance in the aisles, but if you actually hold them against the truth of God's word, they just don't believe it all. I just want to reinvent Jesus in my own image and he's always loving and he's always kind and he doesn't care how anyone lives their life. You might have spirit there, but you haven't got truth and it will not save you. That truth without spirit doesn't save either. Because truth, if it's just a clinical belief, well, even the devil believes. We're going to give our lives to God, and that results in a passion for him and enthusiasm and passion for the one who has saved us. And Nicodemus and the woman at the well, we have completely opposite people, completely different people, and they come from totally different perspectives, but all people must come 
bend their knee, put their faith in God for their salvation alone and worship in spirit and in truth. Who is God's type? The person who knows that they are sinful and need his forgiveness and trust Jesus alone for their salvation from all walks of life who worship him in spirit and in truth. Where are we in our story? We've had a journey to a foreign country. We've had an encounter with a man and a woman at the well. And we've had the discussion of water from the well. Jesus then reveals to her that he is the Messiah, the one who gives life, that he is the groom. And what is the response from this woman? The one who was sneaking out to the well in shame for the life that she has lived? Well, we're going to see how the rest of it plays out next week. So you'll have to come back, right? It's like like that little teaser they give you at the end of a show or something, right? Church, that is the heart of God. All who can admit their brokenness. Rich, powerful, poor and broken, if they put their faith in Christ, can be saved. That's the story of Nicodemus and the woman at the well. And it's your story and mine. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that we see in these two stories that John has put together for us, that the gospel goes across every barrier, gender, race, socioeconomic status, the good news is there for all who see their sin, repent and put their faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for those of us who have done that, we pray that we would be dedicated to knowing your truth because it reveals more of who you are, that we would delve into your word because it reveals who you are. But Lord, we'd be people of spirit, of passion for Jesus who has saved us. Lord, that we would uh, be seen by all to be in love with and passionate about Jesus Christ. Lord, for those here who may not know you, then I simply pray that you would reveal yourself to them, Lord, that they would know that they are sinners, that they fall short of your glory. But Lord, that you offer them life eternal as part of your eternal spotless bride if they repent and put their faith in you. Lord, we just commit ourselves to you this morning in your precious name. Amen.